Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Roy sent me a story, caught my attention for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is I've represented clients who've had similar things happen to them, but also with a similar car. So uh, from Fox 10 News, Brendan Kirby wrote this story out of Alabama. Judge rules Baldwin County Sheriff's Office improperly seized man's Camaro. I've represented somebody whose Camaro was seized and similar allegations. Now, I'll explain what happened in my case, but this case is a bit different because of the confusion. Story of a Chevrolet Camaro, 1968 is the year. Great year for Camaros, by the way. Baldwin County resident who has owned the vehicle since 2016 got a surprise visit from the Alabama Department of Revenue last month after the vehicle identification number of a car registered in Tennessee matched the number on file for this man's Camaro. The investigation uncovered records of a car reported stolen from Kansas two decades ago. So a vehicle was reported stolen two decades ago. Somehow, somehow, the vehicle in his possession has VINs on it that match the stolen car. How did that happen? Well, that set off a chain of events that led to the sheriff's office seizing the vehicle last month, and then a judge ordering it to be returned to this man the man who's most recently had possession of it. The vehicle, however, was then no longer in Alabama. So someone ran to court and got a judge to say, okay, everybody sit tight. Well, the car's already gone. So a lawyer went to court to try to stop the deputies from seizing the vehicle. But apparently, at that same time, deputies were towing it away. The lawyer told Fox 10 News, we probably overlapped. I was probably at the courthouse as it was being trailered. Now, here's the story. The guy who had the car, his son, is a lawyer. And he initially refused to give the car to the sheriff's office. And he said, I want to see a court order. Which, by the way, is not a bad thing. Because someone shows up and just says, we're going to take your car. And it's in your garage and the door is closed. You can say, you know something, I think you should get a court order. I think you should. No problem there. Well, the son, who's the attorney, told authorities he would keep the car in a garage until the matter could be sorted out. That's when deputies obtained a search warrant for the son's home. After a hearing last week, a circuit court judge agreed the car had been seized by extrajudicial action, meaning that they didn't get a court order granting them the right to seize the vehicle. Uh, But what they had done was they got a search warrant. So... The judge ordered the Camaro returned, but by then it was in the hands of the man who reported the car stolen back in 2003. And so, by the way, keep in mind that these facts happen all the time. Someone's car gets stolen. It's gone. They report it's stolen. Never turns up. Five years, 10 years, 15 years. 20 years later, it pops up. And that's what often happens. So, in this case... The attorney says it's not the same car, but this is where the story, I think, uh, gets off the rails. The attorney says at least it's mostly not the same car. According to the attorney, the VIN on the car that matched the VIN on the stolen car report is only for one part on the firewall. (laughs) I'm laughing because that pretty much proves that that is the car that they think it is. The vehicle identification number that appears elsewhere in the Camaro are different. Now, there's, well, I'll, 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 we'll get into that. Hang on. He said, at worst, it's part of the car from Kansas. Uh, meanwhile, the county district attorney, whose office represented the state, declined to comment on the case. Baldwin County Sheriff told Fox 10 News that multiple law enforcement agencies from three states conducted a weeks-long investigation. At the end of the investigation, the vehicle was returned to its original owner, In Kansas, the sheriff's office also recognizes the fact that the person who possessed the vehicle sustained a loss as well. The sheriff's office and district attorney's office are currently reviewing the judge's decision and may approach the court to request a reconsideration. So the man and his attorney said no one knows for sure how a piece of the Kansas man's car ended up on his client's vehicle, (laughs) the firewall. That car could have been, as everybody that watches movies knows about, chop shops. Where cars are cut up, cars are stolen, and the parts are cut up, it's a very good chance that that's what happened to that car in Kansas. But uh, 
the attorney says it's crystal clear his client did nothing wrong. And by the way, I will guess and venture and tell you that odds are his client did zero wrong. Okay? Bought the car, normal stream of commerce, and turns out it was stolen. So the problem is, if he's done nothing wrong, does he still get to keep the stolen car if, in fact, it's stolen? That's the question. So he produced a title that he received when he purchased the car in 2016 from another resident. That man had registered it in Baldwin County for several years before that. Now, that's well beyond the five-year window for receiving stolen property, which apparently is the charge that some people had said, well, gee, if they got a search warrant to look for stolen property, uh, could that be the case? And if the allegation is receiving stolen property, well, it's outside the time limit on that. But investigators who obtained the search warrant indicated they were looking for evidence of a crime. And see, that's the issue. If you are simply in possession of a vehicle that was reported stolen 20 years ago, and you don't have any knowledge of that, other than the fact that you've got the vehicle, are you committing a crime? And the answer is no, you're not. You are in possession of something that's stolen, but it's not a crime. So the proper process here would have been for the state, whoever's in charge of this, to go to court and say, we've got documentation, we can prove this car here belongs to these people over here. And let a court issue an order that says, here's what you're going to do. And by the way, if you go to the court system, you ain't never going to get in trouble for someone saying, oh, you did that wrong. Because you can always point to the judge and go, judge told me to do it. Judge said it was okay. So the attorney says they were not conducting a criminal investigation. They took it upon themselves to go take this car because it felt it was the right thing to do. But they did so without any legal authority. And that is a problem. Now, I'm going to let you know right now. I represented a guy. And which, which car should I choose for its parts to demonstrate? Let's go with the Chrysler Turbine car. This is the car that most people ask me about and say, Steve, I, I know what all the cars behind you are, except I don't understand that copper-colored car. It's actually called Turbine Bronze is the color of this car. So this we're going to use as a prototypical widget car. This is a car, okay? Tires, roof, deck lid, hood, uh, front end, back end, very cool looking bumper. Uh, underneath, you got some exhaust pipes, huge ones to cool off that exhaust and so on. But this is a car. So most cars that have been built in the last, oh, I don't know, quite some time, <laughs> bear vehicle identification numbers. And the VINs on these cars uh, encode a bunch of information, including who the manufacturer is, when it was built, and so on. Over the years, the numbers have changed. They've gotten more complex. And in the old days, though, they still contained information that made them unique to that car. It was a unique identifier for the car. The vehicle identification number that most people are aware of is the one that's at the base of the A pillar. This right here is the A pillar, okay? So you got your A pillar here, and if you were to look, and if this car is anatomically correct, which it is not, most cars would have the VIN at the base of the A pillar on the dashboard. Now, I'm going to let you know right now, I've already made a mistake, but I'm going to leave it in because it is unique to this car. But on this car, the VIN tag was actually inside here, uh, on the door frame or the door jam, uh, but you'd follow the A pillar down. So you could not see the VIN on this car through the glass. But most cars built in America, especially recently, you can walk up the car from the outside and look through the glass. And if nothing is on top of it, you can see the VIN tag. The VIN tag has all the vehicle identification numbers on it. And there's also letters there, but let's not get into that. So that is where the VIN is usually located, okay? So that's where it's usually located, at the base of the A-pillar right there. That is not the only VIN on most cars. Most cars have several VINs on them, so that if somebody were to pry the tag off the base of the windshield, by the way, which is very, very difficult to do because of the way the windshield comes down where the tag is located, there are other numbers on the car, usually stamped into places, Okay. So a modern car will often have the VIN four or five other places. I can tell you that many Mopars back in the day, like a 69 Dodge Charger, if you were to pop open the trunk, and uh, I thought this trunk opened, but it doesn't. What? Well, the hood opens. Why won't the trunk open? Hang on a second. You know, I need to play with my toys more often. I was convinced that the trunk on this thing opened. Oh, I'll put it back. It's probably bad luck anyways to play with it on the set. So, oftentimes with the Mopar, for instance, in the late 60s, you pop the trunk and there's a rubber seal that goes around the trunk to keep water from getting into the trunk. 
And if you peeled the seal up on one side, use the driver's side in the back, you'd see the VIN stamped into the lip of that piece of metal right there. I can tell you because I represented somebody who bought a Camaro that turned out to be stolen, that the VIN on those cars is located elsewhere at least twice. I say at least twice, and again, this is the kind of thing that, that some car guys are going to go nuts over, but it's not always the case that every single car is built identically. So sometimes, for instance, cars might be built in two different plants. You might find out that one plant does something one way and one plant does something the other way on things such as where do you stamp the VINs. Now, on Camaros, the VINs are stamped in two other places, one of which is on the cowl underneath the cowl vent panel if the car did not have air conditioning. If the car had air conditioning, it was stamped below the heater opening, okay? And that's deep inside the car. The other place, the VIN is stamped. And by the way, you cannot see these things very, very easily because they're buried in there. The, these VINs are stamped long before the car is assembled completely. It's stamped on the firewall below the fan motor opening, okay? And so if you go onto the internet and type into Google, Camaro VIN locations, you'll find some photographs showing you where these numbers are stamped. They're stamped in extremely inconvenient locations on purpose because they didn't want people to easily get those VINs out and swap them around. And um, I know that in some cars, it's also stamped on the frame, although I believe the Camaro was a unibody. And so there are other places I've heard stories where people found VINs stamped on Camaros, but it was not across the entire platform. But... It is located in the three spots on the Camaro, base of the A-pillar, on the cowl, and on the firewall. Okay, so, guy says, all we know is that the firewall was stolen. We don't know anything else. Well, first of all, check on the cowl, under the cowl vent cover, or cowl vent panel, and, and you'll find it there. Now, the cowl and the, and the firewall are, are kind of, like, you know, near each other, and to suggest that somebody bought a car and chopped it up and removed the firewall and put it in another car. <laughs> There's another reason they use the firewall to put the VIN. Because when you start taking a car apart, the firewall is part of the basic skeleton of the car. Okay, so I can take the hood off one car and put it on another car, and it doesn't take that long if I know what I'm doing. I can take the doors off and put them on another car pretty quickly. Uh, I can pop the window glass out. Uh, deck lid, not a problem. Wheels, not a problem, right? Fenders, I, all of this stuff. Guess how much work it is to remove the firewall. And again, the firewall, in case you don't know, is if you look at a car, here, let's, let's, let's go with the Batmobile. And uh, sorry about that. And so Robin and Batman are jumping into the Batmobile right here, okay? So again, typical car, right? Wheels. Hood, deck lid, uh, turbine exhaust. <laughs> if you pop the hood on this car, and I don't know if the hood goes this way or this way. I'm not sure I've ever seen the Batmobile with the hood up. But if you pop the hood on the car, there's an engine in there, presumably. Let's go with a front engine car, typically. There's an engine in there. And, of course, you got people sitting back here when the car is driving. So if you're ever sitting in a car and you know there's an engine up here, between you and the engine is a thing called the firewall. And the firewall is the structural part of the car that creates the wall between the engine compartment and the passenger compartment. And so the firewall is there. Every car's got one. It's, you know, as long as there's an engine up there, it's what's between you and the engine. Now, the engine is in the back or it's got electric motors. All bets are off. But the point is the firewall is the nickname or the name for the, the structural part of the car between the driver and the compartment at the front of the car. That's the firewall, okay? You cannot easily remove the firewall from a car. And no one would ever remove the firewall from a car and say, oh, I, I found a better firewall. I'm going to remove it <laughs> and put it in my car to replace the bad firewall in my car. I've, I've never heard of anybody doing that. And in fact, I'm going to tell you a little story. 
Firewalls are often one of the last things that survives after a carcass of a car has been picked over. Meaning that let's suppose I put this car in a junkyard and said it's fair game. Anybody who wants parts can come pick parts off of it. Well, very, very quickly, the hood will disappear. The fenders will disappear. The front end will disappear. The wheels will disappear. The deck lid, the doors, the rear quarters will get cut off. And then pretty soon, it's going to get picked down to where you won't even recognize it. And the things remaining will usually be the floor pan and the firewall. Those are two of the last things that you could even get at in a car. Okay, so years and years and years ago, uh, in about 1971, actually 1771, Chrysler uh, announced they're going to stop building and selling the Hemi, the 426 Hemi, to the public. The last year for the Hemi in the CUDA was 1971. And in 1971, you could order a Hemi CUDA convertible if you wanted to, but not many people wanted to. As a result of that, because it's a convertible, it's the last year, it's got the Hemi, and the number is so small, they became insanely collectible. And so people ran out and tracked them all down, all of them but one. One they had a hard time locating. And some people out there started doing some detective work, saying all we got to do is find this car wherever it might be and restore it, and we can get a ton of money for it. Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And my understanding is they tracked this thing down and basically found... Almost nothing left of it, except for was a firewall, a piece of the floor pan, and uh, the parts of the car that the front fenders hang off of, okay? And you've seen that clip before in a junkyard. Have you ever gone to a junkyard? When a car has been completely picked over, that's what's left. So it's, it's the firewall, floor pan, and the two pieces that extend that you hang the fenders off of. Somebody found that. And they took that and rebuilt it, restored it, took it to auction, and got a ton of money for it. And what made it real was they could prove that the firewall came from the 71 Hemi Cuda convertible. Now, there are other pieces of that car floating around out there. That motor is probably still out there somewhere. And somebody could look at the VIN on that motor, look at the date code it was built, figure all this stuff out, and go, wait, this is the engine from the 71 Hemi Cuda. Can we build a car around this and call it the car? No, you can't. Because the VIN follows the body, and in that case, the VIN was attached to the portion of the firewall. And so the firewall is extremely deep inside the car, and no, no one chopped the car up and took just the firewall out and stuck it in a good car. <laughs> not in the case of a Camaro, where there are so many of them that they're not worth 7 to $10 million a piece. So I can't imagine anybody doing that. But, you know, as my old law professor used to say, you ride any horse going your way. Uh, that's the best argument you got. Because that's what the guy's saying. He's saying, look, you know, look at this vehicle. And we found a VIN in one spot, the firewall. All you can prove is the firewall was stolen. Well, a, a good car guy can look at that firewall and see if it's original to the rest of the parts that are attached to it. Probably. Probably. Uh, that might be up for a little bit of debate. But also, like I said, it's stamped twice on the car, on the cowl and on the firewall, and the cowl ain't far from the firewall. So I suspect that this is, in fact, the stolen Camaro. It probably does need to go back to its original owner. Uh, does the guy uh, whose house uh, this car was at and was seized by the police have a complaint? Yes, because they didn't follow the proper procedure in getting it from him. But he probably ain't getting this car back. And so I've had people ask me before, because I've mentioned that I've represented a few people who've bought cars that turned out to be stolen, and they never got to keep the cars. And I've pointed out that, yes, so what happens is my guy sues the person they got it from. And arguably, that person could sue the person they got it from. And that's, that's, what, that's what you do. Now, some people say, but Steve, this is so unfair. This is so unfair, because there's no way this guy could have known. Um, I just explained to you how he could have known. He could have checked the cowl and the firewall before he bought the car. And I know some people are going to say, Steve, come on. You really expect someone to do that? Well, if you're dropping a bunch of money on an old car, and you've now heard several stories about Camaros being stolen with cloned VINs, um, maybe you should. And I can tell you that I've spoken to a guy who is an expert in Camaros. And he told me that he routinely gets called in to look at vehicles to determine two things. 
One, is it stolen or not? And two, is it a real Z28? Because there are now more fake Z28s in the road than were ever built in the first place. Uh, a fake Z28 is really difficult to mock up properly to fool an expert unless you really know what you're doing. So this guy told me, he comes out and looks at the Camaro, could walk up and go, that's not a Z28. But let's check the VIN just in case to see if it's stolen. And uh, yeah, you need to do that stuff. So I've represented three, four, five different people who had cars that were seized by the police because they were stolen. And in all of the cases I handled, I was able to help these people because they had recently bought the car and the seller was still around. And I would tell anybody out there, if you are going to buy a classic old car, okay, a few years old, if there's any chance that this thing was stolen and dumped back in the stream of commerce with a cloned VIN, and cloned VIN, what I mean by that is you can uh, get a different VIN from a junkyard perhaps and put it underneath the A pillar and make that be the one that's you know, facing the world. And if they ever run that, it might turn up the car was junked at one time or another, but somebody go, oh, well, the guy just restored it, whatever. Uh, but that's quite often what happens. I had a client specifically, that is what happened. They uh, took a late, it was a late model car. It wasn't even a classic car. Late model car, and they'd gone to a junkyard and, 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 and pried the VIN off one that was recently wrecked. But they only pried the one off. And, and the VIN was stamped elsewhere on that car. So, yes, you should check. And that's one of the reasons that courts will come down and say, give this car back to its original owner. Because, number one, it's so easy to prove who owned it and that it's the correct car. But number two, because there's a whole titling process that's based on these numbers. And these cars all have the number on them in several places. And so when you buy the car, you have access to all of these numbers. And you should have access to them before you buy the car. I will tell you, I had a client who bought a car off the internet that was stolen. And uh, he didn't have it inspected before he bought it. And that could be a problem. I would recommend you have it inspected. And have it inspected by somebody who knows where to look for the VINs and see if the VINs all match. So it's a crazy story. I don't know if there are any repercussions here for the police for grabbing this car with a search warrant said they were looking for evidence of a crime. But it was stolen property. And so we'll see what happens there. But I highly doubt that this guy's getting that car back unless he's willing to pay for it because the person it was stolen from would deserve some sort of compensation. So from Fox 10 News, Brendan Kirby wrote that judge rules Baldwin County Sheriff's Office improperly seized man's Camaro, but that Camaro is now out of state. Questions or comments, put them below. Otherwise, I'll talk to you later. And one more time, let's admire the lawyer dogs on this shirt. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Don't be afraid your life will end. Be afraid that it will never begin.